Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing study of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. In the last several lectures, we've talked about urbanization, immigration, and industrialization, some of the most significant forces at work in the country during the Gilded Age. In this lecture, and the ones to follow, we'll turn to politics during the Gilded Age, starting with an examination of the various presidents of that era. The presidents between 1865 and 1901 form something of a wasteland in our political history. Andrew Johnson, the president in the immediate wake of the Civil War and following Abraham Lincoln, was impeached and generally regarded as one of the worst presidents in our history. Ulysses S. Grant was a president whose term was filled with corruption and scandals. And then following Grant, as one person has written, was a string of presidents, their gravely vacant and bewhiskered faces mixed, melted, swam together. Which was which? Hayes, Garfield, Arthur, Harrison, Cleveland. Essentially forgettable presidents. In truth, these presidents may not have been blessed with great intellect or leadership talents, but they all struggled with a divided Congress a divided nation recovering from the Civil War, and other divisive issues. It was a time when the balance of power still tipped in favor of Congress rather than the President. The public was still welcome to visit the White House, and the President himself openly. Elections during this time were almost always close. The balance in Congress shifted back and forth with almost every election and there was no sense of a popular mandate. And none of these presidents were blessed with a crisis like the Civil War or Great Depression, providing an opportunity to make a real name for themselves. As Rutherford B. Hayes wrote in his diary, we are in a period when old questions are settled and the new are not yet brought forward. And so we are left with a run of non-remarkable presidents. The first is Rutherford B. Hayes, who entered the White House when the powers and prestige of the presidency were at a low point. He followed Andrew Johnson, who was one of our worst presidents, and then Grant, whose presidency, as I mentioned, was rife with scandal. And Hayes took office after the controversial 1876 presidential election. The disputed election was thrown into a special electoral commission. Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina were undecided well after Election Day. He was declared the president on March 2, 1877, only two days before assuming office. Hayes was from Ohio. He was a model Victorian gentleman who attended Harvard Law School. He had a successful career as an attorney, and in his early 30s, inherited a fortune from an uncle to secure his wealth. While not a scholar, he did enjoy learning and dabbled in history, biography, and literature. As a proper Victorian, he always said that he would accept an office if it were offered to him, but he wouldn't actively seek it. Hayes was a Union officer during the Civil War, wounded several times and securing his reputation as a war hero. He supported the radical Republicans during Reconstruction and parlayed this reputation to the governorship of Ohio. As governor of the swing state of Ohio, a solid Republican with unquestioned personal integrity and freedom from ties to machine politics, Hayes became a dark horse candidate at the 1876 Republican Convention, which was deadlocked between several other frontrunners. The central issues confronting Hayes were the continued reconciliation between North and South, currency reform, and civil service reform. His presidency got off to a lukewarm start when he appointed both Democrats and Republicans to his cabinet, angering many central Republicans. He followed this by ordering an inquiry into New York's machine politics, overseen by New York Senator Roscoe Conkling, which angered another contingent. While the inquiry into the New York machine indicated incompetence and some corruption, 
Hayes was not able to translate those findings into any real action. Hayes' most troubling issue as president was the South. On the one hand, he sought to preserve the rights of the freedmen that had been fortified during Reconstruction. On the other hand, he hoped to prevent the South from becoming solidly democratic. It seemed a hopeless task. The South was on its way to becoming thoroughly democratic already, with only a few states maintaining Republican governments from Reconstruction, and those only by virtue of Northern troops still in the South. In the end, Hayes decided the best hope for fair treatment of blacks in the South was, in his words, quote, to obtain for themselves the blessings of honest and capable local government. He decided the best way to do this was largely to grant Southern wishes of the federal government. The South demanded removal of Northern troops, and while he moved ahead cautiously, Hayes did eventually oversee the removal of those troops. He provided a generous share of federal patronage for Southerners and liberal support for internal improvements, especially for the Texas and Pacific Railroad. In exchange, Hayes expected the South would preserve the rights won by blacks during Reconstruction. He traveled to Kentucky, Tennessee, Georgia, and Virginia, where he was met warmly by crowds and local leaders. But even Hayes could not long deny the reality that the South was slipping away. No real effort was made to build a solid infrastructure to support the Southern Republican Party. No newspapers disseminated Republican ideas, and no noteworthy speakers circulated in the South. These shortcomings were evident in the midterm elections of 1878. In the entire South, only six Republican congressmen survived the elections, and the Democrats took control of both houses of Congress. After that election, Hayes admitted, by state legislation, by frauds, by intimidation, and by violence of the most atrocious character, colored citizens have been deprived of the right of suffrage, a right guaranteed by the Constitution, and to the protection of which the people of those states have been solemnly pledged. The Hayes administration also had to deal with one of the longest depressions in American history lasting from 1873 well into the Hayes years. Farm prices suffered and unemployment was high. The railroads were especially hard hit. The Depression contributed to the end of Reconstruction as Northerners became consumed with their own financial well-being and less concerned about the fate of blacks in the South. The cartoon pictured here bore the subtitle panic as a health officer sweeping the garbage out of Wall Street, and appeared in the September 29, 1873 issue of the New York Graphic. This cartoon subscribes to the belief that financial busts and panics like this clean out the economy, weeding out inefficient businesses and allowing the strong to survive. This is in keeping with the social Darwinist philosophy that I've described in previous lectures. By 1877, railroads were cutting wages to stay afloat, and workers erupted in dissatisfaction. There were strikes, walkouts, and spontaneous eruptions of destruction of railroad property. Hayes responded to these outbursts only when called upon by state governors and legislatures. Only as a last resort, he authorized the use of federal troops to suppress the labor movement. But in some cases, federal troops served as strike breakers, and workers returned to work without any immediate benefits. In the case of the railroad workers, some benefits did ultimately accrue to them, even though the strike was broken. Public opinion generally backed the workers. The railroad companies were so damaged that they were compelled to treat the workers with greater respect. And the wage cuts were ultimately rescinded as prosperity returned by the end of 1877. The Depression also influenced one of the other issues to confront the Hayes administration, the currency question. 
During the Civil War, the nation had accumulated some $2.8 billion of debt, some in bonds, some in legal tender notes, which bore no interest. These were known as greenbacks, or paper currency. The government promised to repay all of these debts in gold. The problem the government faced was, in paying off the greenbacks, as people cashed them in, the number circulating would continually shrink, and the value of those remaining would then rise. Other people, especially those in debt, urged the printing of more money to control this effect. Hayes benefited in wrestling with this complex issue by having a very capable Secretary of the Treasury, John Sherman. As a senator before being appointed by Hayes, Sherman had authored several acts in Congress governing the currency issue. Most significantly, he postponed payment of the debt and had the Treasury begin stockpiling gold. By the time payments were resumed in 1879, the government had stored enough gold to pay off all the debts as they were presented. All Civil War debts were paid by 1880. Meanwhile, many citizens still clamored for more currency, which would be more flexible than gold and also create modest inflation. Several independent parties rallied around this cause in the 1870s and 80s, running congressional and presidential candidates on some sort of greenback platform. The greenback cause, which was tied to the Civil War debts and too complicated for many Americans to understand, became more readily understood in the cause for the free and unlimited coinage of silver. Unlimited coinage would cause the inflation we discussed earlier. Debtors and the poor wanted it. Creditors and the rich were alarmed. In the Hayes years, Congress passed a bill for limited coinage of silver, but not unlimited. While hardly spectacular, the Hayes administration ably handled these complex and divisive issues. Hayes also began to reassert the power of the president in a number of conflicts with Congress. While again not earth-shattering, during the Hayes years the presidency began to restore some of the power and prestige that had been lost since Lincoln was killed. In the first case, Hayes took presidential initiative and replaced several officials in the New York political machine. This was a routine practice under presidential appointments. New York politicians balked, and the issue went before Congress, which ruled in their favor. Hayes waited until Congress was out of session and then remade the appointments. By the time the next Congress came into office, the issue had passed and Hayes prevailed. In the second case, Democrats sought to prevent Hayes from enforcing order in Southern elections by having federal officials and troops maintain those elections. Democrats on at least five different occasions attached rioters to otherwise acceptable bills that would have prevented federal officials from overseeing Southern elections. Hayes vetoed them all. Eventually, Congress was forced to present compromise measures, but under the Hayes administration, federal marshals were always present during national elections. The Hayes administration also has a generally positive record on the Native American question, certainly in comparison to other presidents of the era. By the time Hayes took office, much of the machinery for confining Native Americans to reservations was already in operation and much of the negative treatment had already been done. Hayes, in fact, ordered an investigation of the treatment of Native Americans and how their affairs had been regulated. The investigation uncovered repeated abuses, dishonest practices, broken treaties, and the like. Hayes and his Secretary of the Interior oversaw the implementation of regulations in this regard, better reporting and accounting systems, and more qualified Indian agents. He also supported the education and assimilation of Native Americans, leading to the establishment of the Carlisle Indian School in 1879. While the Hayes administration encouraged better treatment of Native Americans, they failed to recognize the damaging effects of acculturation during that era. On the whole, the Hayes administration was not particularly remarkable. 
It was generally an administration looking backward, wrestling with issues already in place when he took office. Still, he was a man of integrity and did improve conditions in the White House somewhat. The power of the president was on the mend, and potentially crippling issues were solved diplomatically or shelved for later presidents to confront. Hayes had made a promise before beginning his term that he would serve for only one term. Satisfied with his accomplishments, he held to that promise and did not join the 1880 presidential race. In our next lecture, we'll turn to his successor, James A. Garfield, and other presidents.